All right, by this point, you should know the drill. Okay, we start every sermon in this series by reciting John 6, 35, where uh, it's on the bookmarks that we passed out. It's in your Bible. Um, here we go. Okay, so this is, this, is the, this is our memory verse. I feel like I'm back in Sunday school. It's okay. But this is our memory verse for this sermon series. Okay, say it with me. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Wonderful. I hope that as we repeat that over the list, you know, we have one more week of this. Next week is the last week. I hope that you are memorizing this passage because this is uh, the, the fulcrum on which all of John chapter 6 kind of uh, revolves. It is built up into this point. Uh, today we're going to pick up in verse 51, which is actually the last verse of what we led, read last week, and we're going to read through verse 58. <clears throat> Jesus said, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats of this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give, you, give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood will have eternal life, and I will raise them up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so also whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever." When I was uh, in uh, elementary school, middle school, uh, my, my longtime good friend, Aldi, I was over at his house. Uh, Aldi uh, was, uh, was my best friend. I remember on the first day of fifth grade, I moved to Kenosha. On the very first day that I was there, uh, we're walking down, we're getting in line to go to lunch, and he walks up and says, hi, my name is Aldi, good to meet you. And from that moment on, we were best friends friends. One night, I, or one day, I, I went to his house for a sleepover, you know, as you do. And we're over at his house, and we're trying to figure out something to do that evening. And Aldi says, let's watch an episode of this show that I really like. Back then, you know, we had VHSs. So we pull out the VHS, and we pull out the VHS player, and we put the, the episode in. And I remember the, the show was a British sitcom by the name The Vicar of Dibley which was as ridiculous of a show as I've ever seen. A very quintessential British comedy about a kind of irreverent vicar. That's another name for a priest, by the way, who kind of takes over the priesthood in this small little uh, British town of Dibley. And it had all manner of, of people in this little town. And uh, anyway, long story short, at the end of each episode, as the credits are rolling, they would often end with the vicar telling um, a, a ditzy blonde by the name of Alice a joke. So each episode would end kind of with a joke as the credits were rolling. And, and I remember, uh, you know, again, it's been years since I've seen this show, but I remember that one of these jokes that rolled after the, uh, after the, as the credits were playing was the vicar who, who is sitting there talking to Alice and says, you know, I just heard that the, the Catholics are working on a new low-fat communion wafer. Alice says, oh, Really? And the vicar says, yeah, it's called I Can't Believe It's Not Jesus. That groan is what you're supposed to do with British humor. I don't know if you know that. But that's what's supposed to happen. You're supposed to say, is it okay for me to laugh at that? Now, that is a funny joke, even if a bit irreverent. But it is interesting, right, that in today's text, Jesus says, eat my flesh. There's no diet Jesus available. There's no low-cal version of Jesus. He says, eat my flesh and drink my blood. 
the Jews understandably were told, they're like, whoa, dude, you're kind of weird. <laughs> that, that's a weird thing to say, Jesus. We're told in verse 59 that he, he said these things while he's teaching at the synagogue in Capernaum, right? So imagine you're just like a, an everyday kind of Jew who's, who's going to church on, on Saturday like you're supposed to. And you, you go to the synagogue and here's this new Jesus guy who you've been hearing about. He's been healing people. The other day he fed 5,000 people with bread. You're like, whoa, this guy's incredible, and then he stands up in front of you and he goes, okay, so if you want eternal life, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And you're like, I, are you the guy I've been hearing about? Like, really? What do you mean? Well, Jesus is, he's playing on sacrificial language. He's playing on the image of sacrifices. Where it was common, right, you would take your lamb or your animal, and you would sacrifice it to God, and either you or the, the priestly uh, group would eat from that animal. That was how they would, you would eat that. Remember, we were told the Passover was near, right? The, 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 the Passover is near, and so Jesus is really playing on the Passover imagery. Remember that when, when the Israelites were told how to observe the Passover, yes, they would kill a lamb, and they would drain its blood, and they would mark its door po their doorposts with the blood of the lamb, but then they would eat the sacrifice. They would ingest the very thing that they had offered to God. The point here, but by eating of the, the sacrificed animal, is that it was supposed to transform you in a very specific way. If I go to the priest and I make an act, a sacrifice for my sin, a sacrifice of forgiveness, part of what should happen when I offer a sacrifice asking for mercy and then I eat of that sacrifice, hopefully the way the, that God intended the law to work is that it would make me a merciful person. That by offering a sacrifice asking for mercy, I might learn something about mercy. That was the goal of the sacrificial system. So Jesus is playing on that image. He's playing on that lesson. He says, eat me, the sacrifice. Eat my flesh just like you eat the flesh of the lamb. But he says something extra weird. Right? If that wasn't weird enough, he says something extra weird. Because he says, drink my blood. They don't normally do that with the sacrificial animal. They drain the blood. In fact, there's a reason for this. In, in Leviticus chapter 17, G God tells the Israelites not to drink blood of any animal. This is paganism. This is what he says. He says, any, if, in any one of the Israelites or of the aliens who live among... Wow. Do I have this right, God? Anyone who lives among them who hunts down an animal or bird that may be eaten shall pour out its blood and cover it with earth for the life of every creature. Its blood is the life. Therefore, I have said to the Israelites, you shall not eat the blood of any creature for the life of every creature is its blood. Whoever eats it shall be cut off. That's what, that's what the law says about the blood of an animal. So when Jesus says, drink my blood, he's, he's, he's actually kind of, he's going against it seems what the law said or at least it would feel that way to the israelites who were listening to him we're not supposed to drink blood jesus but i want you to hear why jesus says to drink his blood what is blood the law says that the blood is the life force of the creature we don't we don't drink the blood of animals because we don't drink their life into ourselves. So Jesus is very clearly saying, take my life into you. He says, be nurtured, be sustained, be satisfied from my life. 
force. Eat my flesh, I am the sacrifice. Drink my blood because I will give you my life. Not just any life. This is so important. Jesus says you will have life, but it's not just any life he's offering. He's offering his life. The point that Jesus is making is that the only thing that offers life and forgiveness and salvation is Jesus. All the hopes and dreams and needs of the world are, re- are found in Jesus. It is only Jesus who can heal. And he wants us to know that. But he doesn't just want us to know it. He wants us to chew on it. In, in Greek, there are multiple words that mean eat. And in our passage today, Jesus, he, he switches his language. He starts with just kind of the generic word that means eat. But then he switches to a word that, that, that actually means to chew, to gnaw, to munch on. It's the same word that's used uh, in other places of how dogs would gnaw on a bone. Jesus doesn't just want us to kind of cognitively know that he is the answer of all of our hopes and dreams. He very really, literally says, chew on my flesh. Slurp up my blood. We know a little bit now, as I say that, you're like, I'm glad the Bible doesn't translate it that way into English, because that's weird. But that is what Jesus is saying. You know, we use the the word chew metaphorically in everyday language. Maybe when you were uh, um, uh, at work, either your manager or perhaps someone who worked alongside you would come up and say, hey, have we ever thought about doing it this way? And you would say, well, let me chew on that for a minute. Let me think about that is what we mean. Let me spend some time with that. I remember on, uh, when Lauren and I, after we got married and, and we, were, we were on our honeymoon, and we said we have, one, we have enough money for one like really fancy meal. We were young, and so most of our meals were rather economical. But we said, let's go to like a really nice steakhouse for one meal on our honeymoon. And I remember, you know, this is 13 years ago, I still remember, I went to that, we went to this restaurant, and that steak was so good, I didn't want to finish eating it. I wanted to just continue to taste the food. That's what Jesus says. He says, I want you to chew on me. Taste this. This isn't a new thing, by the way. I mean, the, the, the psalmist in Psalm 34, hundreds of years before Jesus, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. That's what the psalmist says. Jesus says, come taste my flesh. Come savor my sacrifice. How often do we simply go through life knowing that there was a sacrifice made for us? How often do we go through life knowing that Jesus is the way to eternal life? How often do we go about our life kind of knowing, having an idea that, yeah, that's good. But how often do we instead savor that? Do we sit with it? Do we let the flavors mingle? Are we sommeliers of the good news of Jesus? Because that's what he's asking us to do. Savor this. Jesus is not a teacher of abstract intellectual thought. Jesus is a chef who has prepared a meal and he says, participate in this by tasting 
it. There is a short story that I believe to be one of the greatest short stories ever written. Uh, It's written by a Danish man by the name of Isak Denison, written in the mid-20th century. The short story is Bobette's Feast. There's a very polarizing movie about this short story. I've never met anyone who says that movie's just okay. People who have seen the movie from the 80s either absolutely love it and tell everyone about it, or they absolutely hate it, (laughs) and they tell everyone it's awful. The short story, I believe, is beautiful, though, and I encourage you to read it if you haven't. But the story is about these two little old ladies who live in a little town, and there's this woman who kind of comes to them and works for them for years. She cleans their house. She serves them food. And the whole town comes to love Bobette. And then one day, Bobette discovers that she has won 10,000 francs. Lots and lots of money. The, crowd, the, the town begins to, to worry that Bobette's going to move away and they're never going to see her again. Bobette says, let me cook you a meal in celebration of what I've won. All manner of exotic animals begin coming in. And what's kind of funny about the story is that the town decides that Bobette's trying to kill them. Like, they actually think that Bobette is trying to kill them. But remarkably, their love for Bobette is so great that they resolve that they will eat the food even if it will be their demise. Fast forward to the meal. Bobette has labored for hours and hours. And the crowd comes in a little worried. Are we sure about this? I've never tried giraffe. And then the meal is extravagant. The meal is so good that they actually forget what the conversation around the table was. They can't even remember exactly what they ate. They are so full of bliss. It is a nirvana-like experience for them. After the meal, these two women who Bobette has lived with come to her and they say, we're going to miss you so much. And she says, I'm not leaving. What are you talking about? And they say, but the 10,000 francs. And Bobette says, I used all of that to cook you the meal. You have just experienced my richness in the feast. And Jesus says the same. I, all of my riches, all that I have, I give to you. Take my life upon you. Take my life force into you. I'm not going away. I want you to come be a part of me. Come experience my love for you in my food, he says. And the food that I have for you is my flesh. In verse 56 of this passage, Jesus says, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. When we eat food, it doesn't just go to our stomachs, right? I mean, sometimes it goes to our hips, right? We say that. (laughs) We know that part of the problem with Ellie, who we prayed for today, a little eight-month-old baby who needs a feeding tube, we know that the problem is not that she just The food's not getting to her belly. What we know is that the problem is that because the food's not getting to her belly, it's not getting to the rest of her body. It's not getting to her little toes. It's not getting to her little fingers. It's not getting into her brain and to her extremities. It's not getting throughout her whole body because food does not stay in our bellies, right? It is the manner which God uses to nourish our entire being. Ingestion is not about just taste. 
It is about growth and fullness, abundance. It's about living, about abiding. Jesus says, if you eat me, you'll abide in me, similar to the way that crowd abided in Babette. They experienced and they lived into her being in a very real way. But Jesus also says, I will abide in you. Because when we ingest Jesus, Jesus does not just go to our bellies. It goes to our very extremities. Jesus says, I will fill you up if you eat me. I will fill your body, not just living in our hearts or our minds, not just savoring our souls, but filling our entire strength with Jesus. Isn't that amazing? It's so important, I think, for us to remember that that Christianity is not a purely mental exercise. Christianity is an earthy faith. It's a, it's a physical, dare I say, intimate faith. That's why we do things that require our bodies. We baptize people in real water. We together sing songs with our bodies. And it's why we eat real food every week. I told you that the Passover was near, right? Jesus is playing on the image of the Passover, which, by the way, is the time of year he died. He died right before Passover. He is the Paschal Lamb, the one through whom God passes over us. In this way, Jesus is is launching us as readers forward to the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, communion, all manner of names for Jesus' table. You know, the early church, in the first couple hundred years after Jesus died and was resurrected, they took Jesus very seriously when it came to breaking bread when they gathered. Now, remember, this is long before anyone had the audacity to describe the exact way in which bread and wine became body and blood. That comes about a thousand years after Jesus has died. They start saying, well, maybe it happens this way. Before that, they didn't care how it happened. They just believed that it did happen. One such early church father, his name is Cyril of Jerusalem, who was a bishop of the Jerusalem church. He he was writing about John chapter 6 and about communion, and he says this to a crowd. He says, stop, therefore, considering bread and wine to be ordinary, for they are the body and blood, according to the Lord, who made the declaration. For even if your senses suggest to you Let faith confirm you. Do not judge this by taste, but be informed without doubt from faith that you have long been made worthy of the body and blood of Christ. Cyril is saying, regardless of what your tongue tells you, regardless of what your nose tells you about the scent of bread and juice, regardless of what our earthly senses tell us, let the faith inside of us confirm that this is the body and blood of Jesus. He tells us that when we eat it and when we drink it, Jesus says you have eternal life. 
We abide in him, and he abides in us. And so it is my hope that every time we eat and drink together of communion, not just today, every time, I hope that as we eat and drink, we may dwell on the sacrifice of Jesus that was made on our behalf. As we chew the bread, as we, may we savor the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, as we drink the juice, may we, um, may we be filled with Jesus' life force. As we ingest the food, may we invite Jesus into our body fully. May he come upon us in total. We're going to do communion a little differently than we normally do. This is your first time with us. You won't know any different. But for those of us who have been around, normally we pass trays with communion, right? Today we're going to do it a little bit differently. I'm going to invite you to come forward into the middle aisle and come, come down. And then our communion servers will be on either side of this table with uh, a plate of bread and a cup of juice. And I invite you to take a piece of bread, dip it in the juice, and eat it. And then return to your seat by the outside aisles. As we do so, I hope that you will ingest, abide in Jesus. I hope that you will taste and see that the Lord is good. <clears throat> On the night that he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took a loaf of bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took a cup also after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes, Paul tells us. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of the new and unending life in Him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. At the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours. Almighty Father, now and forever, amen. At the end of Cyril of Jerusalem's lecture on communion, he says this. He says, Having learned and being informed, namely, that what appears to be bread is not be bread, but is the body of Christ, and that, which, and that which appears to be wine is not wine, it is the blood of Christ, strengthen your heart, receiving this bread and wine as spiritual, and make the face of your soul shine. Let yourselves, being unveiled with a pure conscience, and reflecting the glory of the Lord, pass from glory to glory in Christ Jesus our Lord, to whom be honor, power, and glory into eternity. Come, be strengthened by the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. If I can have our communion servers come forward, that would be wonderful. Mm -hmm.